I'm back looking at 1 Timothy. Last time we talked about how Jesus Christ is one God. He's our one mediator. We don't have a mediatrix. It's the, all the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need Mary. We don't need a priest. He's one God, one mediator. He's the man Christ Jesus. He gave himself a ransom for all. He died for everybody. Everybody was bought, but they didn't accept the payment. So he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. It, to be made known in the right time, you see. And it wasn't known before, but now it's known. Paul's revealed it to us. And he says, whereunto I am ordained a preacher. So he's been appointed, prepared a preacher and an apostle. He's got the apostolic signs. He's a preacher. He preaches the word. He says, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. He's like, I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth. A teacher of the Gentiles. He's the apostle to the Gentiles in faith and verity. Verity means truth. And he says, this next verse, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So Paul wants men to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And the lifting up holy hands has to do with your prayer life. And... It's like back there in Exodus when Moses and Joshua is going up against Amalek. When Moses has his hands up, Israel's winning. When the hands come down, Amalek prevails. And then Aaron and her get both of Moses' arms, keep them steady up in the air, put the rock under him. That's a picture of people lifting you up in prayer. That's a picture of you sitting on that stone, the stone pictures the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're praying, you got your hands lifted up, and you got two people lifting you up in prayer. That's a picture of prayer life, lifting up holy hands. So he says, I will that, therefore that men pray everywhere. And you hear more today about praying mothers than you do praying fathers. So it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. The men really need to get to praying. And he says, men pray everywhere, not just in church. Think about the places in the Bible you saw men praying. In Jonah 2.1, you got a man praying out of, the, out of a well's belly. In Acts 16.25, you got men praying behind bars, in jail, prison. In Nehemiah 2.4, Nehemiah prays on the spot. Oftentimes, I'll be facing something, and I'll just pray on the spot about it. You got the dying thief praying before death on a cross. In Luke 23, 42, all different ways, all different places you see men praying. It doesn't just have to be in church. It, it's supposed to be anywhere. You got a man praying between two pillars in Judges 16, 28. That was Samson. So, he, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Lifting up holy hands. That's the posture of, of prayer. Solomon did in 1 Kings 8, 22. Moses did it in Exodus 17, 11 through 12. And then it says, without wrath... Look at Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. So he said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath. In that verse it says that all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. 
So you're supposed to put away the wrath. Lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Yeah, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Look at James 1, 6, 8. James 1, 6 through 8. You know, he said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without doubting. And then you look at James 1, 6 through 8. It says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. You know, you want to ask without doubting, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. You know, you want to believe that the Lord can do it. Maybe it's not his will to do it. But you should believe that the Lord can do whatever you're asking him. So, lifting up holy hands. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. You can pray anywhere. Lifting up holy hands, the posture of prayer without wrath, put, a, put it away from you, and doubting. Pray with faith, nothing wavering. Okay, 1 Timothy 2, 9. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So this is talking about women in modest apparel. So it says, in like manner. Notice that at the beginning of the verse, it says, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Why does it say in like manner? Well, before in, the, in verse 8, it was talking about the men. He said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. So maybe it's that men have a hard time praying, and then it's that in verse 9, women have a harder time adorning themselves in modest apparel compared to men. So the men were to adorn themselves with peace, honesty, without wrath and doubting, and a prayer life. That's what they were lacking. That's what they were needing to adorn themselves with. And then you get to the women, it says they need to adorn themselves with modest apparel. Modest apparel that doesn't reveal the body. Because, you know, like Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, 28, if a man look upon a woman a lust after her, he's committed adultery with her already in his heart. And when a woman shows her body, she is being an accomplice in him lusting after her. When a woman shows her thighs, you know, parts of her body that should be covered up, inevitably should be causing men to lust everywhere. And if you go to the store, Walmart, the mall, anywhere, sit down on a bench, you know, you're sitting down on a bench waiting for your wife to get done shopping, or you're waiting in a car, waiting for your wife to get done shopping. When a woman walks by with revealing clothes on, you look at the man, and they will watch her. You look at the men around, and they will watch her walk until she's out of sight. <clears throat> so, inevitably, if you dressed in immodest apparel, you are, even though this may not be your, your intention, you are helping him have lustful, adulterous thoughts about you. So... And Jesus said, if a man look upon a woman and lust after her, he's committed adultery with her already in his heart. And it just goes back to modest apparel. It goes back to treating somebody how you want to be treated. Do you want uh, to? Do you want other women that you see wearing immodest clothes causing your husband to look at them? No, you don't want that. So you should not wear immodest clothes causing their husband to look at you. You're treating your neighbor how you want to be treated when it comes to that. And so it, and it goes beyond the modest apparel. It goes beyond just 
being revealing. You know, some stuff j is just worn to just simply to draw attention to oneself, even if it's not revealing. So that's not good. That's not modest apparel. If you're wearing clothes that just to draw attention to your flesh, that's not modest. And another thing that's not is wearing things that blurs the lines between the genders. For example, look at Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. You have a lot of stuff people wear and it, they're blurring the lines between the genders. Now, and that uh, has a lot to do with your culture, too. And, you know, in some cultures and places, men do wear skirts. Whereas here, if a man wears a skirt, that's seen as definitely a woman's clothing. Now, some people are completely against women wearing pants. But that's, that's not seen as just man's clothing anymore. A woman can wear pants. There's, clo there's pants that look like a woman's pants. And for a while, I remember it was becoming a cool thing for uh, young younger guys that were getting their grandma's pants and wearing them. That was just weird. But, yeah, the, it's, it's just about the culture, too, as well. You know, if it's seen as, uh, in your culture, that a certain type of clothing is a woman's garment and you're wearing it, you're blurring you're blurring the lines between the gender. You, you got to use common sense with it. It says in Deuteronomy 22, 5, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are, are, an abom are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So you see, you don't want to blur the lines between the gender. You don't... Uh, Want to wear something that makes you look like a woman if you're a man. And if you're a woman, you don't want to wear stuff that's trying to make you look like a man. You want to look like what you are. The drag queen stuff, definitely wrong. Very sick, very twisted. Very confusing. You're confused. And the, who are they going after? The children. Trying to confuse them. Trying to get them ready. Trying to groom them trying to make them like them so they can have this big perverted utopia world of drags, sodomites, sex perverts. It's a very sick thing you're seeing. That's not modest apparel. Not only did these drag queens dress up like women, they dress up like hoes, like whores. And they parade around in front of children. It's a very sick thing. And if you can't see that, you are also very, very sick. And you need to get your mind checked. If you think that it's okay for these men to dress up like whores and walk around in front of children, you are one sick puppy. Uh, but you don't want to wear stuff that blurs the lines between the genders. You don't want to wear something that's just to simply draw attention to the flesh even if it's not revealing, and you obviously don't want to wear clothes that's revealing, and then, you know, clothes like shirts that that just say wicked stuff on it, crude stuff. You see a lot of people just wearing stuff with crude stuff on their shirt that's just childish, and it's just to draw attention. Uh, even on the back of some people's cars, you'll be behind them, and it'll just say something crude or show... A sex act, even you, you, you'll uh, come up behind a car and it'll show a sex act on the car. And then the people in the car maybe have kids behind them. And then the kids start asking questions, what's that? You know, that puts you, the parents, in an uncomfortable position. Why would you put that on your, the back of your car? You know, stuff like that. And so, yeah, I don't believe that clothes are a big deal. As long as somebody's, you know, wearing modest apparel, that's all that matters. You know, you hear at churches a lot of times, uh, especially like you listen to like the fundy stuff, they're talking about wearing, a man needs to wear a shirt and a tie. I don't think that really matters. As long as he's wearing modest apparel, 
not revealing himself, not trying to show his muscles off. And it's just modest apparel. It doesn't matter what it is. He can wear what he wants to. <clears throat> a woman, I don't believe she has to dress a certain way as long as it's modest apparel. That's all that matters about clothing. Is it modest or is it not modest? So he says, in like manner. You see, the men have some stuff they need to adorn themselves with. What were they supposed to adorn themselves with? With the prayer life. With uh, godliness and honesty, as it talks about in verse 2. And then the women, in like manner, what do they need to adorn themselves with? Modest apparel. With shamefacedness. Okay, what about shamefacedness? Well, shamefaced. If you're shamefaced, then you're going to be ashamed about th certain things, and certain things are going to make you blush. The thought of, if, if a woman is shamefaced, then the thought of wearing these clothes that make them look like a whore is going to make them blush. They're not going to want to show their cleavage. They're not going to want to show their backside. That would make them blush. And Jeremiah 3.3, 3, look at Jeremiah 3.3 3 real quick. Jeremiah 3.3 3 says, Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hatched a horse forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. So if you're if you're wearing immodest clothes, just in this context, as we're talking about, and you don't care to show your body, your cleavage, what you got, then you got a horse forehead. You're unashamed. Your face ain't even read about it. You're not even blushing. You're unashamed. You don't see nothing wrong with it. <clears throat> so you need to have shamefacedness about some things. Some things should be making you blush. I, when I'm around people and like at work and stuff, they start talking about sexual stuff and all that. That makes me blush. That's embarrassing. And when they can tell I'm embarrassed... It makes for a very awkward moment. Now, if they say it to somebody else and that person's laughing about it, you know, they're good with it. But once they see that you're awkwarded out, embarrassed about it, it makes for a very awkward situation. You ought to be shamefaced. Stuff ought to make you embarrassed and ashamed. So, shamefacedness. The woman needs to adorn herself with modest apparel. Shamefacedness. Look at Proverbs 7.10. Proverbs 7 and verse 10. This is an example of someone who is not shamefaced, who does not have modest apparel. This is Proverbs 7.10. And it says, it's talking about this man and it says, Behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn, and her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, And she goes on and on there. Basically, she's going to get him to commit an adultery with her. And But it said she had the attire of a harlot, showing you that there is a certain type of clothes that a harlot wears. And this is not a woman here that's shamefaced. She's got the attire of a harlot. She's loud and stubborn impudent face now look at proverbs 625 proverbs 625 it says we'll look at verse 24 it says to keep thee from the evil woman 
from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Can one go up on hot coals, and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. You see, when a woman is walking around with a horse forehead, dressed up like a whore, and she's making, get, giving you these looks and looking at you with doing this thing with her eyelids that she does, that is like a lion about to pounce on you. That's, that's just trouble. It says she's hunting for precious life. She's like a, a predator, and especially if it's a married woman. Back there when Abimelech almost got with Abraham's wife, the Lord came to Abimelech in a dream and said, Thou art but a dead man. You got another man's wife. So when a married woman is flirting with you, trying to get you to lust after her body, she's, causing, she's trying to make you play with fire. You're in a very dangerous situation. You don't want to be going after another man's wife. It says, For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? You do that, you're taking fire in your bosom, and you're going to get burned. So, modest apparel, don't cause a man to lust with your clothes. Be shamefaced. Be ashamed about some things. And then in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9, he says, with shamefacedness and sobriety. And that goes beyond just not drinking. It's about being temperate. She shouldn't, you know, be excessive in things. But it also is about, you know, drinking. And the Bible's against drinking. It says in Habakkuk 2.15, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. You see that? How up to date the Bible is? Uh, people giving a man drink, making him drunk, so that they could see their nakedness. And what happens when a woman drinks alcohol? She loses her clothes. Even there's even country songs about it that I have to hear down here in the South that I hate. There was a song that played on the radio where I used to work, played all the time. It said tequila makes her clothes fall off. Tequila, a type of drink, I suppose. It makes her clothes fall off, it said. And look at that verse. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. How true the Bible is. You're not going to be wearing modest apparel when you get drunk. The tequila makes your clothes fall off. You're not going to be shamefacedness when you're getting drunk. You lose all your judgment. You ain't going to be ashamed of nothing. You're going to be on top of the table swinging your shirt around your head before it's over with. So, modest apparel, shamefacedness, sobriety. Not trying to have a mom's night out where you go to the club acting like you're 22, partying like it's 1999 and you weren't even born in 99 yet. And <clears throat> she needs to be temperate. She shouldn't adorn herself in gold, pearls, boarded hair, costly array. You see, and it it's not about that you can't wear gold pearls or costly array. It's that that shouldn't be your adorning. Look at 1 Peter 3, 1 through 5. You see, you got a lot of people that say a woman is not supposed to wear jewelry or make her hair look good or wear makeup or costly array. That's not what this is talking about. It's saying don't let that be your adorning. Don't let that be the main thing. Don't let that be what you're all about. Don't let it be 
what would draw somebody to you. It says in 1 Peter 3, 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. I think it says to your own husbands because the woman is tempted to be in subjection to other people's husband. And once they're with their husband for so long, uh, they start wanting somebody else's. Just like a man, once he's with his wife for so long, he starts wanting somebody else's wife. It says that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. You know, saying if you've got an unbelieving husband, he can be won over to the Lord by your conversation, your way of life. He can see it, and that would win him over to the Lord. It says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair. You know, it shouldn't be how you fix your hair or of wearing of gold, the type of jewelry you got, or of the putting on of apparel. You see, if you... If this was saying that you couldn't have uh, nice hair or wear jewelry, then it would also be saying that you couldn't put on clothes. This is saying don't let putting on of the putting on of apparel be your adorning. Don't let it be about what you're wearing. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, the Lord Jesus Christ in you, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. That is the most attractive thing about a woman, a meek and quiet spirit, not a loud and stubborn one like that woman in Proverbs. It says the meek and quiet spirit is in the sight of God of great price. You want to be a meek and quiet spirit, not loud and stubborn, not coming, coming in cussing and being one of the guys, not saying perverted stuff not flirting and acting like a hoe. But it says in 1 Peter 3, 5, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So you see, adorn yourself in modest apparel, shamefacedness, sobriety. And that will help a woman more than anything there, just like that other stuff will help a man more than anything. So it's the woman more tempted to wear the immodest apparel the man more tempted to just not have godliness honesty and a good prayer life so that's what he's told to adorn himself with so in like manner also back in 1st Timothy 2 9 in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Have sobriety about this stuff. Don't get so into the broided hair, gold, pearls, costly array that that becomes what you adorn yourself with, what you're all about. But let this be what you're all about in verse 10. But which becometh women professing godliness. That means when it says becometh women professing godliness, that means you want to be doing things that would match a woman who professes godliness with good works. You see, just because we're saved by grace, by faith, doesn't mean we don't mean, need good works. So that which becometh women professing godliness, that means you're doing good works that would match somebody that professes to be a Christian. For example, Titus 2.3. If you want to turn to Titus 2.3 real quick. In Titus 2.3, it says, The aged women, also, aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Their behavior needs to match somebody that's uh, holy. Not false accusers. Not given to much wine teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, 
to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So you see, the aged women, you got a lot of aged women that just can't grow up. They're 50, 60, 70. They still wear the attire of an harlot. They still drive down the road listening to rap music that's talking about the most vilest stuff around. There's just no, there's not, you don't hardly find a good praying godly grandmother anymore. The grandmothers now, they act like they're 22 again. And uh, it says, The age of women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. And then the next verse says that they may teach the young women to be sober. So if you're acting like that, you can't teach the younger women how they're supposed to act, to love their husbands. They don't teach you to love your husband no more. They come in and uh, they call you up on the phone. They'll come into wherever you're working at, start talking to you, and they're talking about how much they hate their husband. They'll tell you, don't ever get married. I hear older women telling younger women that. I remember before I was married, when I was really young, and I remember uh, I worked at this store and all these older trashy women would come in and they would be telling the younger girls in there, don't ever get married, just just stay single and just, just have fun, don't ever get married. That's stupid. That's the most unwise thing I've ever heard. Just because you went out and married a bum, you're going to go tell all the younger women that they don't need to get married. Maybe they're not going to marry a bum like you and they teach all they're doing they when you go and you bash your husband to all these other women you're not teaching them to love their husbands to love their children that's not teaching them to love their children that's their husband's uh, that your husband is the children's father when you're when you're uh bad mouthing husbands and stuff it's not good for the children because they need their father. So you see, they're, they're going around teaching all the wrong stuff. They don't have any sense. They don't have any wisdom. And the men are the exact same way. The, the older men today, they have no wisdom to pass down because they've spent their life doing stupid stuff. Watching TV. Watching ball games. Playing video games. They haven't got any wisdom. They've not gotten the Bible. They've never grew up. So when it comes to teaching the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, they don't know how to do it themselves, so how can they do that? When it comes to the older men teaching the younger men, they don't know any Bible. They don't have any wisdom. So how they can, can they do it? They can't do it. So you see that the mess we're in with that. But back in 1 Timothy 2.10, But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. We need good works. Paul talks about how we need to maintain good works. You need to wake up in the morning, say, I'm dying, I, I'm going to die daily. I'm going to reckon the flesh to be dead. I'm going to do good works. And I'm going to do good works with the right motive. Not to make, um, make a show in front of men but because God wants me to do these good things. And then it says in verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So she's supposed to learn in silence with all subjection. She's supposed to be in, this, in the context of marriage be in subjection to her own husband. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And since this is going to be in the context of the husband and wife, that's what this is talking about. You see, the Bible has the picture of Christ is the head of the church, as the husband is the head of the wife. So when the woman's the head of the husband... It messes up, up the picture of Jesus Christ being the head of the bride. It wouldn't make sense to put us, the bride, as the head of Jesus, 
Just as it doesn't make sense to put the woman, the head of the man in the marriage. And, you know, you could also still use this as that a woman should not teach or usurp authority over the man in, in the church because if you got a woman pastor and her, I mean, her husband's going to be in the congregation, she would be teaching and usurping authority over the man. And that's just uh, icky feeling when you when you got a congregation full of men, but yet you got a woman teaching. Do they are they not manly enough? Are they so lazy that they couldn't get in the Bible, get lessons, sermon outlines together, and them teach the Bible? They had to have a woman do it, and just like we talked about. The other day, you know, I like Trump and everything, but he's 70-something years old, and his spiritual advisor was a woman 30 years younger. That's a twisted thing. That's a, that gives, that's a, should give you an icky feeling to know, I mean, do you not, do you not, are you not a man? Do you not feel like a man? Doesn't it hurt your manhood that you're 55, 65, 70 years old? And you're going to a church and you're listening to a 30-year-old woman or a 40-year-old woman teach you the Bible. That would hurt my manhood. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather lose an arm wrestling to a 12-year-old girl than to know so little Bible that Paula White or Joyce Meyer or Beth Moore could teach me the Bible. That would hurt my manhood worse than getting... Uh, punched in the face by a ten-year-old girl, and it and it hurt, and or knocking me out or something. I'd get, I'd rather get knocked out by a ten-year-old girl than to know so little Bible that Joyce Meyer could teach me the Bible. See what they're doing is all this stuff I'm saying sounds so uh, harsh and offensive because they brainwashed you into thinking a woman should be a man. And that a man should have all these feminine qualities. And that's exactly what they're doing. You see it everywhere. In subtle ways, uh, you see that they're trying to give women m male qualities and give the men female qualities and twist things. And this is nothing but an attack on the family. They want to break down the family. See, God wants it to be a man and a woman and children. The children need a manly man. The children need a womanly woman. Or just maybe not even a, a, a I don't mean just a super macho man. I'm just me, a, a, a man that acts like a man and a woman that acts like a woman. They don't need a man that don't know what he is and a woman that don't know what she is. And when you start blurring the lines in between what they are, it's a breakdown on the family. They want to attack the family. And when you do that, you just, you're just going to have a world full of crazy people and perverts. But they're always attacking the family. That's what the homosexual movement is, an attack on the family. So it says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. So the women preachers are out. They're out. That's just, if Joyce Meyer, Paula White, Beth Moore, they... They, if they can't even get this down, they have no place teaching anybody anything. Now, this doesn't mean uh, that a woman couldn't teach another woman or a woman couldn't teach small children because, obviously, it talks, it talks about them teaching the children. It talks about them teaching the young women. It just says, neither to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And let's look at a couple of verses for this real quick. 1 Corinthians 14.34. In 1 Corinthians 14.34, the context of the chapter is prophesying and speaking in tongues. And obviously, I don't believe we speak in tongues today because that was a sign of the apostles. And the tongues are for a sign 
And 1 Corinthians 1.22 says the Jews require a sign. 1 Corinthians 14.22 says tongues are for a sign. So we don't speak in tongues today. But in the churches where they do speak in tongues, I've been to them before when I was younger, and it's a whole bunch of women in front of the church speaking in tongues. But look what it says in the chapter about tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14.34, Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it's not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in church. Well, what's, what's the context here? Was tongues and prophesying. So she's not supposed to, she wasn't supposed to speak in tongues, and she ain't supposed to be prophesying or preaching. So that's the context there. And so you see these speaking in tongues churches are wrong. Even if tongues were for today, they're breaking all the guidelines for it because they got, they got women speaking in tongues and they're also doing it all at the same time. Whereas here it said, let it be by two, let it be just two or three and that by course, meaning only, you know, two or three and one at a time and not, it couldn't be women. It had to be men doing it. And so they're breaking all the guidelines, even if it was for today. But the main point I was getting at was, it says, let the women keep silence in the churches when it came to uh, tongues and prophesying, which, you know, preaching. So women preachers, that's not good. Now, I'm not, now women are, they should be preaching the gospel. You know, a woman should be proclaiming the gospel to people. But in the sense of being over men and teaching men and having authority over men, that's not good. And this sounds offensive and mean because you're so brainwashed by the crazy people in this world. A long time ago, women would have no problem with this. Bible-believing women have no problem with anything I'm saying. It's, it, and I feel like I'm being offensive because my brain's even been affected by the people around me. You can't help it. Like, y you hear this stuff all the time and it, it's going to affect your brain. If it wasn't for the Bible, your brain would just be completely affected and overtaken by their philosophy. But it says, Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So the big reason women can't teach is because Adam was not deceived. It was the woman that was deceived, that was in transgression there. So women shouldn't be the teachers and the preachers because they're more easily to be deceived. But I'll stop there. We'll get more into those last few verses next time.